A dachshund duo on a mission of destruction. But Pet Trainer 911 is here to put a stop there. In the market for a new puppy, we're here to help you make a match that will last. And a termite terminating team. One part exterminator, one part eagle. This time on Animal Attractions. Hi, I'm Megan Blake. Welcome to Animal Attractions, the show dedicated to the deep affection people have for their pets. And I'm Alex Boylan, and this here is Zulu. Today, you're in for a treat, as we're going to meet a highly specialized man and dog team whose mission is saving homes. Also, if your pet just can't seem to stop scratching, our pet vet, Jenna Kastner, is here, and she'll help you get to the bottom of it. But first, we're going to meet two empty nesters who were seeking comfort and joy when they adopted two little dachshunds. But instead, they got agony and misery. Double trouble for Pet Trainer 911. Mark and Iris Kramer got two dachshunds, one for him and one for her. Because little dogs should be easy to manage, right? Wrong. All these dogs have managed to do is eat their carpet, their walls, and leave a path of destruction and heartbreak behind them. What is this? What did you do? Honey? Honey Bun is clearly the dominant dog between the two dogs. So although Bo, through the first few months that we had him, did minor puppy things, what happened was after Honey Bun came into the house and she started to do mischievous things, he is a follower, so he felt it was incumbent upon him to do the same thing that she did. The mischief quickly turned into expensive damage. So it was necessary for us to actually replace things. They were partners in crime in that they created incredible, not only mischief, but destruction within the house. Uh, Bo is the one who has real watchdog tendencies. And whenever the bell rings, he just goes berserk. He runs to the door and then she follows along with him. Hello. Hello. Sorry about the dogs. No problem. Have a nice day. And they both bark and bark. If it's, if it's somebody they don't know, the barking continues until the people leave the house. So it's really difficult to have, it was very hard to have people over. They will chew anything. They chew through towels. They chew, they've taken, I don't know, four or five of Iris's bras. And they don't just chew them, they chew right through them. We found carpeting being chewed. The wooden part of the stairway was chewed through, and they started making holes in the walls. Bo, because he's a larger dog, has the ability to jump higher. So if you left any food on the table, be it cereal or steak or whatever, he would be quick to grab it like lightning. It just wasn't working. So we knew we needed somebody who w was used to working with dogs who had already been destroying houses, and it seemed like that's what we had. They never had the dogs trained, the little dodgers. So um, they were just doing what a dog gonna do. You know, be bad. The dogs are running the house. And if there ain't no structure from the owners, the dogs is, is just gone to the dog, if you want to say. <laughs> How you doing? Hi. Come on, Hi, I'm Iris. Come on Hi. in. I would just follow the sound of your barking. Oh, okay. Oh, oh I hear them. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> They already told me when I rang the doorbell, the dogs was going to be barking and they weren't going to be quiet. And they were right. These oh. are just some of the things that they do that drive us crazy. Oh, uh-huh. Okay. Those little dogs pull you? Yes. 
Uh, and how old are they? They're about a year. Oh, and they're not housebroken? Not really. Oh, uh-huh. Are they sleeping in the bed with you? Yes. Oh, we're uh-huh. done with two spoiled dogs. That's right. Uh-huh. Yeah, what we're going to do, we're going to take the dogs for 30 days, and uh, then we're going to train you for seven when I bring your dogs home, and when I leave, the dog leaves. And then after the seventh day, the dogs are all yours, and you're well trained, and if we can train the owners, the dogs will stay trained. It might take longer to train us. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It was sad to see them go off, you know, and I think, you know, looking at their little faces, you know, thinking that we were sending them away or whatever. It was hard, but if, you know, if they were going to stay here and, uh, you know, all of us get along nicely, it was necessary. They're ready to go. They're pulling to there. Oh. They're little dogs, but they did a lot of damage at their own, their own home. So they, they needed to come to boot camp to get some structure. Yes, yes. So when I took the dogs from the, the owner's home, I knew that they weren't going to roam around my house because they used the bathroom in their house, they're going to use it here. So I immediately tethered them down to get them comfortable with me. Stay. Even though they're little dogs, we treat them the same way. Just like if they were big dogs, little dogs, we treat all the dogs the same way. But we do do a special training with the little dogs. We train them on our knees because I believe standing tall and the dog is down there looking down on him, it's nothing but a big echo to him. So I'll get on my knees and go through his commands with him and they go through the sit, the down, the stay, just like the big dogs. Hey, stop, sit, down, stay. And then once he learns it and he's hearing me, I'll stand tall and tell him. Once we take the dog through his obedience and he gets something, you can go over to him, tell him to drop it, or tell him to leave it. Drop it, leave it, and take it away from him. And he doesn't try you. On the paperwork, it says they drop, won't drop clothes and socks and shoes, so I'll take food. I work them with real food, with a burger. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. And if a dog would drop a hamburger or a piece of chicken or a pizza, he would drop them socks or them shoes or them sandals or some clothing. He would drop it. How you doing today? All right, how you doing? All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. you. Have a good night. You too, sir. David. One of the problems were when the doorbell rings, they constantly bark. So I got a doorbell and I had somebody to push it and the dog started barking, quiet. and I took and let him run to the door, and I told him quiet, and then I'll send him back to timeout. 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 Every day I may hit the doorbell just to see can I get them to bark. And before they leave, quiet. Timeout. They ain't barking anymore. Timeout. I know the dogs are ready to leave boot camp when the dogs are listening to me. Because if the dogs are listening to me, they listen to the owners. And that's where the work starts, when I start working with the owners. Hello. How you doing? Hi. Here's your baby. They're back. Hey, baby. <laughs> Coach brought them back, and he did a demonstration of, you know, some of the things that he taught them to do. Okay, so what we do is I tell them, heal. Heel, come here. Come here, heel. Come here, heel. Place. Place. Stop, sit, down. And I think that Mark and I just kind of watched with our mouths open, wondering what happened to our dogs. Time out. Coach came and worked with us, and he corrected us. Say heel. 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 walking. So it took a lot of practice until we got the right tone of voice and, you know, we got to, you know, pulling on their leashes and not telling them that they were good because there are certain behaviors that he says are just expected from them. 
Say down. Sit down. Stay. There you go. You're doing real good with the dogs. Now you got to do it every day for 10 or 15 minutes and just be consistent. We saw that it was something we definitely had to stick to because the dogs can see if you are getting weak. <laughs> How you doing? Final day? Hey guys! Hey, you go, Mickey. Hi, so we get to keep him for good? Get to keep him for good. It was like they weren't our dogs. It's like someone came down, and I don't know what fairy or what angel came down and took all the bad behavior and replaced it with good behavior. You did real good. And if you got any problems with the dog, you just call me. I'm always your dog trainer. And all you gotta do is just keep Take them through their uh, commands. So you just give me a call whenever you Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Nice really meeting you. Appreciate it. It's a delight being able to walk the dogs down the street and they listen. Walking with them is a pleasure. We take them for walks every day and they strut around very proudly. It's a delight when you can have people over and they listen. It's just, it makes having a, the pet experience that much more pleasurable. Having a dog that listens as well as this loving. Getting a new puppy or even an adult dog can be a great experience for anyone. This is Blue, he's a cardigan corgi. A new member of the family can bring immeasurable amounts of joy into your home, but choosing the right dog for you that's the most important thing. There are many other factors that you need to think about before bringing a new dog into your home. What's your financial situation? Do you have kids? Do you travel a lot? What's your work schedule like? These are just some of the other factors that you need to contemplate when looking for a new dog. A key consideration when buying or adopting a new dog, especially with pure breeds, is what were they bred for? Dogs are broken up into seven different groups or functions, which describe their original purpose and demeanor. A popular group is the sporting group. They are high energy, very oral, and always looking to play, run, or swim. The retriever and labs are perfect examples. So if you are a person who enjoys the outdoors, has room for a new furry friend to run free, the sporting dog may be an ideal match. Blue here is the smallest member of the herding group. Initially, the herding group was bred to work with and for man. Like Border Collies, Australian Shepherds, and Shetland Sheepdogs, they are constantly searching for a job to do. Do you think you would enjoy hours of playing fetch or frisbee? What about training a dog on an agility course? This group takes a lot of energy, as they were not meant to simply be pets, if left alone or not worked with, they can actually become agitated towards their owners. So make sure you have the time and willingness for a herding dog. Now if a long, fragrant walk in the woods is more your speed, maybe a member of the hound group should be your next best friend. Beagles, basset hounds, and dachshunds have a very high-tuned sense of smell. They were bred to hunt in groups and love being around many people at one time and are very easygoing and docile so they make great pets for the family. They were designed to hunt for hours, even days, meaning your kids can play all day with them and they will not tire out, but your kids might. The next group is often thought of as workers. Well, because that's what they were bred to do. The working group has been guarding and rescuing people for centuries. Dobermans and Rottweilers were bred to protect families, while St. Bernards and Huskies were meant to help people in distress in frigid climates. <coughs> Yet, contrary to popular belief, they can actually make great companions for everyday people. But beware, with this group, more than any other, training is crucial. If you're looking for more than a simple pet to take walks with or protect your property, you might want to check out the Terrier group. Jack Russell, Scottish, and Fox Terriers are popular breeds of this group, 
who were originally bred to protect farmland from the critters attempting to devour the crops. They are eager students who require much attention, yet don't need the extensive exercise of the sporting group. They make great apartment pets and love the excitement of city life. Another group that is a good fit if you're a city dweller is the toy group. You know these dogs as the cute and cuddly pups that travel in people's purses and sit on their laps. Shih Tzus, Pugs, and even Chihuahuas make great watchdogs. So if you're looking for a little, low-key dog to love, think about the toy group. Finally, the non-sporting group is a catch-all phrase that groups together small and large, working and, and well, lazy dogs. Dogs like the French Bulldog and Boston Terrier were bred simply as companions, while the Dalmatians and Chows were bred for different guarding jobs. Just be sure to do your homework and make sure you're dealing with a reputable breeder when looking for unique dogs. When you begin your search for a new dog, make sure you understand the breed or the mix of the breed. That way you can plan for its needs and training. But most importantly, make sure it's a good match for your lifestyle. Do a little research or contact a vet. If you work nine to five or more, there are a few toy breeds that enjoy their peace and quiet. Even greyhounds, they actually sleep most of the day and can be a great fit. But if you work from home or have a flexible schedule, a sporting dog can be a perfect match. Taking them running or to the beach are great activities. So whether you're in the market for a new puppy or just an old buddy, do your homework and compare what you've learned to your lifestyle. Remember, there are very few bad dogs out there, but there are a lot of bad matches. So do your part and make sure you have the perfect match. When you think of your favorite kitty colors, I bet an array of colors come to mind, like brilliant orange to mysterious black like Toot Sweet here. Well, I'd like to introduce you to a breed that gets its name from its luxurious, warm-colored coat, the Havana Brown. Brown doesn't always have to mean dingy and dull, particularly in the case of the Havana Brown, a unique breed of cat with a sleek, mink-like coat and a dark reddish brown. Though bred specifically for its color, the Havana Brown also has a personality as warm and inviting as its fur. The experiment was using a Siamese cat with a black American shorthair cat, and that produced their first brown cats. Um, then naturally, for several generations, they bred them until they could get just brown cats. Havana Browns certainly are brown, all the way to their whiskers, with no markings or variations of any kind. They have startling oval-shaped eyes and a variety of vivid greens, making a dramatic contrast with the rich mahogany coat. There's nothing plain about this brown wrapper. The only cat that does have actually a muzzle um, and they have, their ears are rather large and they flare at the bottom and they kind of tilt forward like they're really interested in what they are doing and <laughs> for the most part they are. The Havana Brown is surprisingly heavy for its size. This is because it's extremely muscular beneath its silky outer layer. One specific health problem that we do notice in the Havana Brown seems to be in the dental or the tooth region. You are going to want to get with your veterinarian early on in your cat's life so that he or she can get you started on a preventative dental health care program so that hopefully a lot of these problems can be avoided later on in the cat's life. Havana Browns are smart, but not as snooty as many cats. They love company and crave affection, much like a dog. They love learning tricks and obeying commands, and some will even retrieve. Havana Brown owners all agree that the Brown is the best deal in town. Is your dog keeping you up at night or driving you crazy with all that itching and scratching? This could mean that your dog has an allergy. You may find this surprising since in people they usually have respiratory signs such as sneezing and runny eyes. But in dogs, the target organ of an allergy is their skin. Allergies are a reaction by your pet's immune system to something that the body recognizes as foreign. The three most common types of allergies are flea allergies, food allergies, or environmental allergies. Food allergies don't develop right away. 
My clients often comment that their dog has been on the same food for a while and wonder why now they're developing an allergy. Actually, this is typical. About 70% of dogs have been on the same food for over two years before they develop an allergy. Proteins such as beef, chicken, or wheat gluten are usually the culprit. For this reason, your veterinarian may recommend a food trial as a way to diagnose this. This way, you put them on a new protein diet, such as venison or fish, and eliminate those other proteins that were causing the problem, and you should see an improvement in their skin condition. As far as flea allergies go, one surprising thing is your dog doesn't have to be infested with fleas for them to be a problem. Just one flea bite is enough. Sometimes you don't even see the flea because the dog is so aware when they get bit that they actually eat the flea before you even see it. There are medications to help with the itching, but prevention is definitely the key. Your veterinarian will help decide what the best course of action is for this. The environment can also be a source of allergens. Dust mites, pollen, and mold are some of the most common ones that your dog can be allergic to. Blood testing or skin testing can identify the exact cause of your dog's allergy, and a specific allergy vaccine designed for your dog can be made. This can be a little bit expensive, but in the long run, it actually usually ends up saving you money because it minimizes the amount of times that you need to see your veterinarian for the itching. And one more thing, it's not uncommon for your pet to have more than one allergy. So see your vet and they'll get you on the right track. You often hear stories of surgeons and concert pianists who must protect their hands. You must keep them in optimal working condition. But imagine your dog is so special, you must protect its nose. It's not a job for the ordinary handler. Your assignment, if you choose to accept it, preserve the nose of a super dog. A man and his dog. But not just any man, and not just any dog. This is a highly specialized unit. A high performance work team devoted to a unique and important job. Everyone wants to know about Brandon, everyone who comes in, everyone who calls, they want to know if he's real, if he really does termite inspections, and he does. It's amazing that he can just locate exactly, exactly where the termites are in your house. Hey, Rick. Hey, good morning. Hey, Brandon. We have a canine today. Yes, sir. Here's your paperwork. All right, thanks. Have a good day. You too. What sets Brandon and the canine inspection apart from a human inspection is visual inspections, you can only see 33% of the house. You cannot see what's inside walls, underneath you know, the ground, you just can't see that. With using the canine, it's basically an x-ray. Brandon's nose is 400 to 600 times greater than a human's nose. He's able to find termites under bathtubs in places that a human couldn't inspect. And it's very important that I train with Brandon every day. Um, what it's designed to do is there can be a number of different scents inside a wall. So you want to try to, you train the dog to pinpoint live termite scent and to be able to pick it out of other scents like termite damaged wood, dead termites, you know, plastic, whatever anybody could, you know, that could be left in that wall. I have uh, four training stations. The first one basically has a little plastic container in it, but we want to make sure the dog does not alert on plastic. So we put that in there empty. Uh, the second canister actually has termite damaged wood that we basically got from a house that we did a treatment on. The third canister is just blank. The fourth canister actually have the live termites in it. When he goes into work mode, it's almost like football. He gets his game face on. And his nose goes and it starts tracking and tracking until um, he finds a uh, termite or a termite colony. Hunter T's, Brandon. Hunter T's, let's go. It's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work, Brandon. Find your T's, let's go. Good boy. Good boy, Brandon. The dog isn't trained to associate that live termite scent with the food reward that I give him. That's a good boy, Brandon. Good boy. Good boy. For the last three years when we've been recertifying through the University of Florida and through um, the Canine Academy, um, Brandon and Rick as a team has um, scored 100% in each test, even outperforming all the other dogs in the country and even his original um, trainer. Brandon really enjoys what he does. When we get ready to do the inspection, uh, he'll get real excited. And hey, how you doing? Hey, Rick how and Brandon. Nice We're here to, to do canine you. inspection today. 
human nose has 5 million scent cells. Uh, Beagle's nose has about 250 million scent cells. And what it does is it enables him to be able to scent detect through stucco, through brick walls, through concrete slabs with stress cracks. It's like early detection for cancer. You're able to find a problem before it spreads through the rest of the house, saving the homeowner thousands of dollars in damage. On your teeth, let's go. Show me. Good boy, Brandy. Good boy. There's there's word commands, and they're actually part of the inspection. Um, some of the things I say, Brandon, are you ready to go to work? And I'll tell him to find his T's, T's being short for termites. Uh, when he does find termites, I'll say, good boy, Brandon. And he'll come to me and then I'll reward him and say, show me, show me, Brandon. And then he goes back good and shows, boy, you know, it's just part of it. It's gonna work. I'll do the inside first, then I'll take the dog out on the outside of the structure, run in the same area. On your teeth, Brandon. If the dog alerts in the same area where he did on the inside, then we'll dot it with an orange dot, but it, what it does is it confirms that termites are actually in that wall. If you can pull the scent from both sides, then you know that's where they are. We finished the canine inspection, and we did have one alert at the fireplace. You couldn't do the inspection without me, and I couldn't do it without him. I um, mean, you know, it is a team. Everything we do from the time we get up to being in the truck all day to doing the inspections to, you know, doing meet and greet, it wouldn't be, there's no way you could do it with one without the other. Brandon is part of their family, not only with the family, as well as Rick's pets. He has a little dachshund and his small kids, and they all interact real well. And, you know, but everybody knows that they have a celebrity living with them at their house. Good boy, Brandon. Good boy. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Animal Attractions. If you'd like more information on any of the features you've seen here today, visit us at www.animalattractionstv.com. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you later.